Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. So this is uh, the third session on strengthening federalisms in the India Economic Forum that is being organized by CII and the Scotch Group. Uh, in this uh, session, we will discuss uh, how to strengthen the federal finance or the fiscal federalisms. Now the subject is a little technical and my, uh, uh, I'm just going to give you a perspective, very simple perspective, not a very technical perspective of uh, the, the, the federal aspects of governance, what we really mean by federalism and how it is relevant and what are the basis of the contemporary challenges? These are the things that we are going to uh, discuss here in this uh, session. Before I introduce the panelists, a very eminent panelist here, let me just uh, say a few words about uh, federalism. The federalism is, is a method of dividing powers so that the general and the regional governments are each within a sphere, remain independent, and at the same time they cooperate. So both autonomy and cooperations are inbuilt in the definition of federalism. And if we emphasize the word cooperations, we sometimes use the word cooperative federalism, whereby both the union and the states or the federal government or the state government, they cooperate with each other. If it's a multi-order federalism, then all three orders of government, they cooperate with each other. So federalism uh, or the federal form of government is, is quite important and all big countries are federal. Whether you take US, you take Brazil, you take Argentina, Canada, except China, but the China, the constitution is, uh, no, is not federal, but the functioning of China is very federal in nature. There are two processes uh, by which uh, the federal governments or the federalisms devolves. One is that you are coming together like US, the many federating units came together and you form a federations. The other, which is the case here in India, that you are devolving the powers. India was one country, and you devolve the powers, created many subnational governments. So certainly, when the processes are very different, when, whereby many federating units coming together and forming a federations, the power of the states are there. The power of the states are more, or the powers of the regional governments are more than the powers of the federal governments. Whereas if you devolve the powers from the top, then certainly the powers of the central government or the federal government or the union government is little higher than the subnational governments. This uh, particular form of governments have been adopted in big countries and this has been adopted in some of the small countries. This has also been found as solutions, you know, treated as a solution in a post-conflict uh, environments such as Bosnia, Sudan, Nepal, and even Sri Lanka. So <clears throat> most countries are federal in nature, and this uh, uh, concept actually it evolves over a period of time because the systems are not the same. So India has made about 100 odd constitutional amendments. US made 27 constitutional amendments. Brazil have changed their constitution seven times. So it evolves. And it also uh, a functional concept, not really an institutional concept. So whether your federal, your constitution is federal, if it is not working, this may not be federal. The examples are, uh, there are various examples, including the example of South, Korea, uh, South Africa, whereby, uh, the, the scholars generally speak outside South Africa, that South Africa is a federal country, but they are not allowed to speak that India, that South Africa is a federal country. And there are uh, 
many uh, non-negotiables under the federal polities. You have to have a written constitutions, and uh, the constitution has to be very, very rigid, so that if you need to change the constitution, you have to have at least two-third majorities. Uh, at least, there should be at least two orders of government. And both have the power to legislate. There could be three orders of government, but at least there should be two orders of government. And in case any kind of conflict arises, there should be some courts to interpret the provision of the constitutions. Uh, <clears throat> there are four pillars of uh, fiscal federalism. First is the assignments of uh, responsibilities. Various orders of government need to be assigned certain, uh, certain responsibilities. And there is some order uh, internationally. Some literature has been written on this. Uh, the prominent among them is uh, by Richard Musgrave, the father of the modern public finance. When you assign the responsibilities, you also assign the concomitant revenue handles. Generally, there is a mismatch between the responsibility assignment and the revenue assignment. So, there would be intergovernmental. That is the first, third, the third pillar. So, you need to transfer resources. Generally, the resources are transferred from the top to the bottom. There were cases when the resources were tra transferred from the local government upwards. The case there was the Yugoslavia and USSR and many experts say that led to their disintegrations. So when you transfer resources, you also need certain institutions, that some impartial institutions, and they can decide that how much money need to be vertically transferred, and which state or which regional government should get what. So the examples there are like uh, in, in Australia, whereby they created a Commonwealth Grant Commissions because uh, one of uh, the some national unit that is uh, they threatened to secede. So it's about 100 years ago, they created the Commonwealth Grant Commissions. On that lines, India created the Finance Commissions. Similarly, there are cases uh, in, in South Africa whereby you have a Fiscal and Financial Commissions. So <coughs> you... Uh, you have a revenue assignment, you also have expenditure assignments and uh, intergovernmental transfers, and then the institutions. Now come to the case here in India, Article 1 of the Constitution says that India, that is Bharat, shall be the union of states. The Constitution does not say that India is a federation of states. It only says a union of states. Because if you adopt a federal form of government in the constitutions, this is what uh, Ambedkar thought of, then there will be a provision of secessions. But in Indian constitutions, only coming in, you cannot go out. I'll just take a minute. So, okay. so, so it's, a, it's, it's a union of states. But there are a number of features by which we can say that India is a federal constitution. First, that there are two orders of government and both have the powers to legislate. There are institutions which transfer resources, uh, for example, the institution of finance commissions. And uh, between the states and the, and the local government, you have institutions like uh, the state finance commissions. Uh, so, so in India, the Federal Assembly, it, it, it comprises the union government, 28 states, because now the Jammu and Kashmir has been made uh, union territories with legislature. So there are now 28 states. 10 of them are considered a special category states or a hilly or a northeastern states. They get a special fiscal dispensations from the union governments as well as institutions like finance commissions. There are nine union territories, three of them are with legislatures and rest of them are other union territories. 
Down the line, after the 73rd and 74th constitutional amendment, we had uh, Panchayati Raj institutions or Panchayats. They are again at the three rungs. You have District Panchayat, Block Panchayat, and the Village Panchayat. So about uh, 2,50,000 odd Panchayats and 4 million elected representatives. So we have so many governments in this country. On the, there in the urban areas, we have municipal municipalities. Uh, there are three levels, municipal corporations, municipalities, and Nagar Panchayats. The definition of these bodies are not there in the Constitution, but these are there in the Conformity Acts. So each state defines what municipal corporations, what municipalities, and what Nagar Panchayats are. So <clears throat> generally, the, uh, in India, the union government collects more taxes, they spend less. About 60% of the taxes are being collected by the union government, and they spend about 40%. The reverse is the case there in the states. The states collect about 40% and spend 60% of the total public expenditures. So there is a need of vertical transfers. So the finance commissions is one institution. There are other institutions. Uh, the planning commission was there in place. It has been substituted by Niti Aayog without any kind of financial powers. Then there are institutions uh, including the interstate councils. Uh, the National Development Council was there in place, which has been substituted with the Team India. Between the state and the local government, we have institutions like the State Finance Commissions okay, to transfer resources from the state consolidated fund to the panchayat and municipalities. In order to discuss uh, the nitty-gritty of this, we have a very, very eminent panelist have with us. I don't think there could be more eminent panelists than we have here with us. We have uh, Mr. N.K. Singh himself, he's here, he's uh, chairman of the 15 Finance Commission and uh, who is just, uh, will be submitting his interim report very, very soon. So uh, he's here with us and uh, he, he, he was uh, the chairman of uh, the uh, FRBM Review Committee, uh, of which uh, the RBI Governor and the Chief Economic Advisor and the Director and IPFP, Mr. Ratin Roy is not here at the moment. So he was also a member. They uh, submitted uh, the proposed uh, 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 kind of a path, uh, the fiscal reforms path uh, to the Government of India. And uh, uh, Stan K. Singh, uh, he wears many caps, whether we call it, uh, whether he's an economist uh, or a politician or a civil servant. Uh, he started his career as, uh, uh, as a teacher in St. Stephen's College, uh, teaching economics. And he actually learned uh, economics from his childhood. His father was uh, the first finance secretary of India. And uh, uh, he, he was a civil servant, a member of a very, very distinguished Indian administrative service, joined the service in 1964. And uh, he, he retired from the Ministry of Finance as the Secretary uh, Expenditure or Secretary Revenue. Uh, then he moved to the Prime Minister's office as OSD. And later on, he became the member of the Planning Commissions. He was also a member of Parliament, so he wears many, kind, many caps. In one word, I can say that he's a, he's a senior statesman. And before I introduce the other panelists, I would like to request Dr. N.K. Singh.